Well, hello and welcome, everybody. You know, cloud is a critical component for any organization's digital transformation. But with so many options, it's not always clear how best to proceed. You now, your path to success will be built on the unique requirements of your organization's business initiatives and the mindset of your stakeholders. I mean, how hard could that be? Well, today's show is about cloud strategy and the value of being cloud smart, not necessarily cloud first. More on that in a moment with our special guest conversation. Hey, you know what? Welcome to Tech 37, your home for technology, education, and collaboration from Worldwide Technology. Well, hello and welcome. So glad to have you both with us uh, for this conversation today. Because actually, you know, I was thinking, oh, we're going to talk about cloud. Well, yes, but it's so much more than that. And so I'm excited for this. Um, Dave, it's been good to get to know you better, but I'm going to start our introductions, I think, with Maria as she's, uh, she's our most important guest here. I think we both agreed on that uh, quite a bit. But Maria, first of all, thank you for joining us. I wonder if you could just give us a quick uh, a background or on yourself, who you are and how'd you get to where you are now? Uh, thanks, Rob. So I am Maria Stirk. I lead the Cloud Services Organization for Reinsurance Group of America that's uh, located headquartered here in St. Louis. Um, I've actually spent over a decade in cloud computing, starting in product development to product management, a couple of years in consulting, just focusing on cloud transformation, security, and compliance. And now in my current role, it's the first time that I've been part of an internal IT shared services group. So just kind of a plethora of experience with cloud. Okay. Yeah, you've got a couple of different angles on this. And Dave, you were telling me you've got some angles on this as well. And actually, it's some good stories, as I've heard as well. But are, now, are you, are you in the St. Louis area as well? Yep. I've been here since I was uh, in kindergarten, Rob. So it's, it's home. Uh, joined Worldwide about two and a half years ago in this role as a general manager of multi-cloud. And, and we've got a team of people that cover all three major clouds and, and some of the key ISVs that we're seeing in the industry. Uh, background is too many years in the IT space, uh, but I had the pleasure of running three small software companies that were uh, product and services companies before joining Worldwide. So, so been in IT my whole career. Okay, and, and and all sides of the equation too. It sounds like for both of you. Um, so, as you've covered a lot of stuff in your careers, and Marie, I think we're going to center this conversation a, a lot with you, um, kind of being just a great. Uh, if if you will, I know we're not going to talk about RGA specifically, so I want to make that clear. Um, you know, as we were talking earlier, it's your experience, both the, the pluses and the minuses, the steps that you've taken that maybe you wish you could take back, maybe you wish you'd done them a little bit differently, started certain things a bit earlier. If we are able within this show to pass any advice on to our audience in terms of, of um, a better way to do certain things, because this is still a real, I couldn't help it, cloudy area for many people. <laughs> um, someone had to do it, I guess. It, uh, those are probably too old to do. But um, nonetheless, you've got wisdom to share. So in your background, and you're, you've worked with multiple organizations and stuff like this, I, we talked a little bit about cloud, uh, some terminology around uh, cloud first versus cloud ready. Um, I wonder if you could differentiate that terminology from your perspective uh, and how it relates to kind of the decisions that you're making and, and where you're providing guidance um, in, in your various projects. Yeah, I can definitely start with kind of the different cloud frameworks. So, you know, when you think about organizations that are cloud curious, you know, they are putting processes in place. They're talking about people, processes and technology and small experiments. Mm -hmm. um, when you start to go into cloud ready, you should have experimented a little bit, but then you really invest more in the POC. You know, you decide who your partners are going to be. You should be working on the frameworks. Then when you get to Cloud first, that's where there's really that switch. It's really how you hire. It's your procurement practices. It's everything you do from all the telemetry that you receive to what you should be measuring and when. So I think there's definitely a, a significant change in terms of investment um, and support from your executives when you go from cloud ready to cloud first. Well, let's talk about that. As, as I look at, at specific ways in which you know we could maybe draw out uh, items that, that everyone should consider is you're, you're saying there, you're talking about the importance of, um, what's the right terminology for it? Uh, executive buy-in. Uh, I know yeah. there's a bigger word for that, but 
you know, how, how do you, how does one go about doing that? And what does that mean? If can you contrast that with what does it look like when you don't have that? I, I bet you got stories. <laughs> um, oh, a- absolutely. Absolutely. The thing about cloud and cloud migrations in general, it takes significant investment. It is a culture change. You are changing the focus and the way that teams work. Um, and any lack of buy-in is really that blind spot, right? So if you can't get your board to believe in the security of the cloud, if you can't get investment into the proper tooling to ensure that your teams can work, new pro- there's new processes all across IT. You know, it's yeah. not just your cloud teams, it's all of your shared services teams, and that takes investment. Well, this reminds me of something. So in our previous conversation, we were getting ready for this episode, Dave, you'd brought up a story and I don't remember because you probably didn't say who the customer was or where the experience was, but you were quick to point out the fact that you, that there's a difference between looking at these kind of things as a project versus, um, here I am uh, short on words, but it contrasts to the fact that you can't think of these things as a, as a oh, we're going to go make a cloud investment. It's not a technology project with a begin date and an end date and stuff like this. And uh, Marie's nodding her head, but Dave, what was that story, and what what is what's important to understand here? Well, I think two two points there. One to play off Maria's point, and one to play off your question, Rob. The, to Maria's point, executive buy-in used to mean, "Hey, I've got the funding to go do this project." And really, what what cloud first means from an executive buy-in perspective means is the corporation has decided they're going to change the way they do business, transform their organization maybe reorganize their departments, knock down silos, and then use the technology that cloud brings you to accomplish things faster and more agile. Fail faster even is a good thing anymore, right? And so it brings you that opportunity where in the old days it used to mean, hey, I just need to go get this project funded and then I go do that project and then I'm done. And with cloud, it's a journey on continuum. It's not a project mentality. Well, and when it comes to that, Maria, I'm curious what, you kind of nodded it that there being stories, but I got to think, so if you, if you go into this with a project orientation, I guess this is something you do. And this is one of the things I would love to maybe help some avoid uh, because it, it probably is something that's going to reveal itself pretty quickly is that you start running into um, you mentioned uh, de- interdepartmental uh, coordination uh, support from the top. And, and it struck me that when you were saying investment, you weren't talking money specifically, although I'm sure that's part of it, but you were really talking about a time investment and a, uh, a mind share investment perhaps within an organization. So you're talking about cultural changes. Is that fair to use that word in that sense? Absolutely. I think org change management is key to success there. Okay. Um, and I do think when you go from a project mindset, what you find is because cloud enables many teams in many ways, and there is so much overlap in terms of what projects are going on in pockets of your organization. So once you start thinking about business capabilities and microservices, then you can start to combine efforts you know, across your organization where you're looking at light capability implementations. So you're really trying to knock out duplication across your environment. And with cloud, that is a huge thing because people can move so quickly. So I think Dave's absolutely right. When you go from project to product, it is making sure that you're making the right decisions and you have that right perspective and product ownership to make sure everybody's moving in the same direction. Is it possible? Yeah, I know we even follow it up real quick, yeah, Rob, no, with, with, you know, I, I even see some of our customers and Marie, I don't, you don't have to talk about RGA specifically, but you know, they're moving IT staff and employees and talent into other organizations. And you haven't seen that before. You know, we've always had IT as a standalone organization. And what we're seeing is, hey, we're going to dedicate these 50 people to manufacturing. We're going to dedicate these 50 people to marketing and sales. We're going to take these people to put them in finance and apps. And, and they're becoming part of the business, which is which is critical because there's nothing a business doesn't do anymore that isn't technology driven. So having IT be a major contributor to the business, as opposed to just an asset of really talented people that do their own thing is really where we're seeing a trend. Yeah, that is, that's a hundred percent correct. Because even when we talk about measuring and Rob, I know we'll we'll get there later, but measuring in terms of business value and getting business terminology and buy-in is so critical. And it just did not used to be top of mind in any IT organization. 
And, and if you're starting on something, because let's assume that anyone that we're talking to in this conversation is already an ongoing right. operation of some sort. And to a certain extent, everyone is also, I think, has dipped their toe in cloud, whether they intended to or not, you know, with shadow IT and other things like this. But I hear Dave making a really good point that you've got to think bigger than IT um, because of the way it touches things. Um, you can't have those. There, there's not real rigid walls that won't just get you in trouble, it sounds like. But what you're also saying is, um, uh, well, now I lost exactly where I was going on there, but you're talking about a, a notion of, oh, in terms of getting started, if you're just dipping officially into making some cloud-oriented decisions on where to go, how possible is it or how hard is it to say, to set some goals for what, what should be done first, what should be measured first, how slow or fast should we go, what are reasonable expectations to put on ourselves? Is, is there guidance you could provide for any of that? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of organizations, that's why really, you know, the cloud native organizations have such, um, they just have a lot more momentum and speed when it comes to moving, you know, getting applications yeah. and modernizing. And you're talking about general. companies that are smaller, maybe that started doing Absolutely. that technology first. They don't have the existing infrastructure to deal with. Um, that's exactly right. Just, and legacy processes, because, you know, yeah. everything from the ticketing perspective, how we make decisions, who owns decisions? Ownership is such a critical thing when you're moving to the cloud. Um, so what I would say is baseline what your metrics are going to be. You know, partner. If you were AWS, you know, and if you look at their CAF, their cloud adoption framework, they really do provide guidance. They provide steps. They provide assessments that you can at least know the big rocks, like know the things that you should be thinking about. Yeah. Um, but you definitely have to keep in mind who's going to be decision makers, how you're going to empower those teams to move quickly, or you're you're going to fail pretty quickly if you get caught, you know, amongst all of the different IT shared services teams. That's so funny. I don't think I would have, I'd expected to hear it, but there's the, and forgive me because I'm not going to say the word, but RTFM, it was an acronym that I'd always grown up with. And basically what you're saying is you need to read the manual, um, <laughs> that there's, uh, and you're right, AWS, I think, well, Google and Azure as well, these guys have put oh, yeah. a lot of time into um, uh, notating their code. You know, it, they're, they're, there's a lot of information there, and it, and, it, and it can be overwhelming. But also, I don't hear you talking about specific clouds. You mentioned AWS because that's who you've worked with perhaps recently, but this really yeah. isn't a conversation about um, one cloud being better than another, correct? You talked about yeah. cloud-ready doesn't mean AWS. And cloud first doesn't mean something else, right? Um, yes, absolutely. It, it's okay. how you work. Cloud yeah. changes how you work, whether it's a hybrid cloud, whether it's your private cloud. You want to make sure that you have processes that allow your teams to blur those lines of where the infrastructure is coming from. You just want to empower the business to move quickly. So, you know, for us, we definitely use cloud agnostic tooling and we really focus on process optimization across all IT teams to support cloud. Yeah, and I would, I would offer yeah. up just an observation as well, Rob, real quick. Our customer base, you know, is, is, is a lot of like the RGAs of America. They're, they're very large enterprise customers. And so this is not a one year project kind of mentality of, oh, just shut down my three data centers and get me to cloud, whatever that means. I don't, I don't know, but that's what we hear in the market. It's much more of a, hey, I've spent hundreds of millions of dollars refreshing data centers the last couple of years, whether it be compute, storage, networking, et cetera. How do I leverage my investments and get more innovative and agile while moving to the cloud, quote unquote, and those hybrid plays or co-location facility, they may be just as important in that multi-cloud, cloud smart strategy as a public cloud. So you've really got to sit back and look at those outcomes you're looking for. And then to Maria's point, look at where your strengths are as a business and weaknesses and then we'll really make your plan. That plan isn't an encyclopedia. It's, you know, maybe a living, breathing document that just keeps getting updated and updated as you go and learn. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you mentioned three kind of areas of focus when we'd spoken about the, the need to begin with strategy. We've kind of talked about it here. Um, but also you have a heavy emphasis on then what also what needs to be measured and the importance of of because I think a lot of people say that, but you actually seem to imbibe it and uh, it seems to be ingrained. Um, 
based on the examples that I've heard already, and I want some more of those, uh, because you said most people aren't measuring uh, or reporting on progress. They're wasting a chance to really share some success stories, um, you know, because maybe they're just moving too fast and they're not they're not putting in those signposts. Uh, but you also mentioned when to celebrate. Um, let's work backwards from there. So when to celebrate when there's something that doesn't have a direct end to it, it's not a project that has a real end date. What do you mean by that? That means that you build a culture of celebration. Like literally we start every one of our monthly meetings with what are we celebrating this month? Um, and then even working backwards into metrics, you, you can definitely put in, you know, if we have this many services, this many new capabilities, let's celebrate. If we've automated, you know, this many hours that, you know, we put into automation, we've saved this amount of dollars, let's celebrate that. We celebrate skills. Um, we're really working to um, align new technologies and emerging technologies with skill development within our organization. And even when we find that outside of IT, we want to celebrate that, right? We want to celebrate how RGA is growing as a whole, not just um, our team celebration. So I really do believe it's it's creating a culture that learns and celebrates learning. And that that's critical because I feel like IT in the past was more knowers. Who's right? Who knows the process? Who should, who's that one person I should go to? Um, yeah. well, and there's that only was, two that kinds of my, people in IT, those who get it and those who don't, or, you know, <laughs> variation. Very that was my yeah. biggest battle in consulting. You know, the knowers, this is the way we've always done it. This is it. You yeah. know, whereas if you have a learning organization, people are flexible and they change and they grow. Let's talk a little bit about measurement. And then another term that's come up a lot when we've talked um, is uh, you've used the term governance uh, quite a bit. And I want to make sure I'm understanding what you mean by that and, and where it comes into play and why it's so important. Can you give us examples of, of things that should be measured um, and, and how that plays with governance? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're talking about governance, you really have to look at compliance, you need to look at operations, and you need to be doing that while you're building. So, you know, as an organization, you need to set your framework first and say, you know, from a configuration management perspective, here's the 10 boxes that we need to check. We need to make sure everyone realizes that. And as they develop, those things are built in. And then you really have to put aside time, especially with application development teams, for tech debt, if they have not met I'm your sure government, I said that. you said tech debt, like D-E-B-T? Yeah, absolutely, okay. during the build process, right? So if there is drift from your intent, from your governance, mm -hmm. you need to correct it in the build process so that it's, it's part of your automation, it's part of your code. Um, and that way you make sure security, privacy by design, that's all built in. And if that governance happens up front, you're, you're in a great place. And then you can continue to, you improve your security posture as you go and you do that as code rather than getting to a place where maybe you're doing a secure pipeline and you have an audit right before production. And then you realize that you don't have any of these boxes checked. So the amount of rework afterwards is considerably more than building it into the process. Well, to yeah, I think point earlier, I would offer something like two more, it's really similar. It's, um, you know, we, when we talk to the app dev teams of, of our customer base, you know, they're really struggling at times because they, they understand that they're driving costs into the business that the business hasn't seen before, right? Public cloud in particular costs. And mm -hmm. what we talk about with our clients is we've got to balance the ability to have innovation and not create a, a set of guidelines that's so stringent up front that we can't have creativity and really cool thinking up front. And then maybe that's a sandbox in the cloud, I'll call it. So there's no real rules there and we're not gonna go public with it and nobody's gonna ever see it. And then each part of that app dev journey, we get a little more constraint and a little more constraint. We're gonna meet the business objective, but to Maria's point, we've automated and followed the rules that the business has set forth to keep us safe and secure and efficient in the cloud. What's interesting to me when you say, both of you are talking about this too, is that, um, there's a part of me that always, you know, it's been bandied about where someone goes, well, cloud, it's just a, it's just your data center in a different location. And it's really not that it at all. It, it feels like it is doing things differently. And because of that, you've got to be careful of simply trying to map 
existing processes and existing ways of doing things, they're not going to map directly over. And it sounds like even if they did or you felt like they were, you probably were not going to be getting the results that you anticipated. It'd be like, what's the point? Um, I'd feel like it seems like it's been a lot of thought. It feels like it's gone into these things, Maria. And I bet that's it. We probably can't see it. Not that you have calluses on your hands. I wouldn't want to imply that, but you've worked hard um, uh, to be able to do this. And I was um, OK. So on the measurement side, you talk about governance. And when you mention compliance, uh, when you say compliance, are you I, I tend to being an ex security kind of person, I tend to think of government mandated compliance and things like this. Is that what you're speaking of? Or you're speaking of compliance based on perhaps structure that's that's self-implemented, so to speak. Well, especially being in financial services and insurance and specifically, you know, highly that's regulated that's industries. That's yeah, the, the, every industry that I've worked with as a consultant has some sort of regulation and compliance is changing. Privacy is so important now that no matter what industry you're in, there is a standard, whether it's, you know, GDPR, whether it's SOX, whether it's just, you wanna make your customers you know, comfortable with your processes. So you have a SOC yeah. too. Like there, those are all different things that, you know, most businesses are trying to achieve from a compliance perspective. Well, you had mentioned some guiding principles. Um, and I, I think they're associated specifically with RGA, but they feel like they're, they'd be guiding principles that you as a, as a person um, has taken on. Do you mind if we, if I ask you about kind of understanding how these work and how they relate to each other? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the, well, the first one, security and risk control. Um, I love when someone makes the point of separating the notion of security and risk, um, because too often I think they get conflated. Um, why is security and risk control the very first thing on a principle um, that, you're, that you've decided is important to lay out publicly? Well, for us, obviously, again, insurance industry. Yeah very important on the privacy side, very important on the security side, but to continuously evolve your security with the changing landscape is critical. I mean, when you really think about the vulnerability that cloud does bring, you know, it could be one misconfiguration that opens up a whole storm. So continuously evolving your security posture, but you do so based on the risk of your business. So, you know, look at it on an application by application basis, and if it's not, you know, a business critical application, then there's flexibility. But if you're always looking at it with a framework based on risk, you can make the right security decisions. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and these are all going to kind of tie in together. But the second one on maximize cloud benefits um, reminds me, I feel like as a, as a setup to this, going back a bit to the notion of cloud ready versus cloud first, I feel like is important to understand because you corrected me in a previous conversation, thankfully, for the, and I appreciate it. I don't mean that um, because um, I wasn't really emphasizing correctly this notion of, of uh, you guys have not mandated that cloud has to be done a certain way or that everything's cloud. Cause you do hear some customers, at least I hear them from my strange angle on things. Some people at least verbally say, it's all about the cloud. Everything's going to the cloud, but everything's not going to the cloud. Um, and those are decisions that every company has to make uniquely. And I feel like maximize cloud benefits. And there's going to be a couple other terms in here. Yeah, actually, because the cloud first comes up as well. But maximize cloud benefits. Can you explain how that actually begins to take form um, uh, for you? Yeah, absolutely. So you have to really understand your culture and its threshold for change whenever you decide what your principles are going to be. So when, you know, RGA specifically went to the cloud back in 2015 with their first cloud application. Um, and so we were really focused on as we continue to migrate, let's not lift and shift, let's lift and transform. But we also know that there's baby steps too, right? There are some applications that you will lift and shift for now, but you can't leave it there. You need to come back and optimize based on priority, right? When you have the space in your team to reprioritize that workload. So that's really what we move by mean by maximizing cloud value is really assess the business value of the move before you decide whether or not to lift and shift or to refactor or rebuild. Once again, I feel like there's measured decision-making going on here. Uh, yes. pragma <laughs> pragmatism perhaps. Um, uh, the third one is repeatable portable delivery. Cool. What does that mean? Yeah, so, it, and it's really pattern driven. So the repeatable is the most important part. We know that portability is everyone's aspiration, 
but really that is something that right now you have to get good at what you do. So making sure that you have a process that is repeatable, make sure that you have a way to communicate that process. And when the process changes, make sure your communication channels are there as well. I think that that's very, very important. It comes down for us to dashboard driven accountability. Um, if the patterns are there, you know, we have dashboards to support it. Again, it's that metrics focus. I come from you know military and manufacturing background where you want to see, you know, where your problems are. And so visibility is really key there. Yeah, Dave, you were saying earlier, fail fast. Um, and it feels like that plays into what, what Maria is saying too, in terms of if you go too long without realizing, because I think, I, I think one of the big things I run into is I could be failing, but not know it for a while. Um, and, and thus I'm building a lot of, uh, I'm accruing a lot of technical debt on top of something. It's going to be really hard to undo. How, how are you seeing Dave from a bigger perspective? Cause you've worked with a lot of different customers. How well is this thought process just three points into six principles? How many customers do you feel like are at that level of maturity even as individuals in terms of how they're thinking, much less executing? Yeah, I, I think it varies by customer. There's some that are very, very good at it. Um, and there's the, and those people typically have dedicated a, a, a amount of time for their IT staff to get familiar with all these things, right? These are these are new trends and new topics for everybody. And so to, to think that they've got their full-time job that they've had for 10 years, and now you need to understand all these multi-cloud decisions too, is really a challenge. And so it's the companies that, to Maria's point, not only invest the dollars to spend moving workloads to cloud, it's that they reinvest in their people to upskill to these new technologies because talent's hard to find out there and hard to retain. And so if they're not feeling that you're investing in them at this point, they may go somewhere they feel that th that investment's gonna be made to up their career. So that's what we're seeing with our customers. It's funny because that's one thing I like about Tech 37 is I keep working with people who are a lot smarter than me and I have to resist the urge to just be completely intimidated by how someone would, would do a lot of these things. Uh, but moving on to the fourth point and uh, away from my groveling, um, we talked about this one a little bit, but I don't think I ever let you speak to it enough. And so, but the, the fourth on these principles is cloud first. That is a very specific meaning to you, correct? Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, the RGA strategy was cloud ready from 2015 until this year. Um, and now we've gone to cloud first. So we are really looking at procurement is huge. Uh, when you really look at cost transparency, making sure that everyone knows the cost decisions that are being made, all teams have dashboards, um, really focusing on maximizing investment even within AWS to ensure the best discount as we move forward because we're going so quickly. Um, how we hire is very different. You know, yeah. we're, we're really looking at our strategy. We just spent 11 months doing uh, an org design uh, where we went from two roles in our cloud center of excellence group to 11. So it's really assessing, you know, how is the business changing? How do we need to better support the business? And how can we transform from ticket taking to advisory services for all the app dev teams? Oh, that, okay. Give me so many different yeah, things. Yeah, there's something else to throw in there too, Rob. Yeah, I had one, one CTO of a, of a customer say, you know, Dave, I, I'm not even sure how to express this to my CEO or CFO, but this application that if we had developed it in our traditional approach in our data center would have taken us about a year and I've got it out and working in five months. So how do I express seven months of cost savings to have that application out for our customers to use in five months instead of 12? Yeah, that, that one's because Maria, you mentioned, you'd earlier mentioned this notion of making sure you're, you're counting up like the cost avoidance and you're, mm -hmm. you're not failing to recognize uh, success um, factors that sometimes go by so quickly that we don't, we don't honor them with the fact that it could be as simple as automating a process that reduced someone, uh, you know, from eight hours to an hour. We kind of expect that to happen. And that's an extremely small example, but you multiply those things out and they really do add up. How are you guys, or I want to say how you guys are doing it, but how do you recommend someone track success metrics like this when they're big, they're small, they're short and long? How does one kind of ass assimilate all that? Yeah, I mean, you have to have a framework in place. You know, yeah. for us, RGA has like a kind of a PMO office, but if you give them what the measurements are, you have people tracking them, make it easy. 
Um, you know, they developed an API that let them track automation, which was fantastic. Oh, that's cool. um, but when you're tracking automation, you can't just look at cost avoidance because that's only one piece. There's okay. speed and agility that helps the business. But the other thing is moving those same people to higher value activities and measuring those activities and those advisory services because you're not go you don't want to let people fear that they're going to lose their job you need to encourage and celebrate and measure the new capabilities that they're empowered to do because of the time that they have back so yeah. that's an important argument i'm so glad you brought that up because i i think we always speak to or at least me being a kind of an, very it hardware oriented background there's always this notion of, well, what you want to do is you want to automate so that you can free up people to uh, to do more valuable things with their time. You're paying a high-end person to do a menial task that could be automated, and then my conversation ends there. <laughs> and what you're saying is, is that is part of it, and you guys actually are, are, are have put in processes to account for the data uh, that, that accumulates to say, well, let's say, is that really happening for us, and, and can we build upon that because that's ideal uh, but it's nice to put some some uh, numbers behind it. It sounds like you're doing that. Um, yeah. I, re I do really like the fact you had the fifth point here, maintain data center services, which I think is a, just a great, for me anyway, and I don't know, but an overt call out to the fact that um, as much as things change, so many things can't and shouldn't change. Uh, and there's probably some decision making that goes uh, goes into that. What, what, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I know that, that one is critical to us because that is um, – a culture-based decision, right? We have a lot of teams that support our data center services. We want to make sure that we are implementing processes where our teams, cloud teams, data center services teams, those lines are blurred. We wanna make sure that the processes are standardized across all of our teams so that no matter what infrastructure platform we decide to use, um, the teams can be productive and they don't feel like anyone's left behind. And that's very, very important to us. Um, our technology delivery team, they have done an amazing job working with WWT on our data center relocation effort right now. They looked at things like cloud adjacency. They looked at several other um, contributing factors to how we select our data center. And it's just, it really gives the team's confidence to know that that is part of our cloud principles is to maintain yeah. those services. Well, I'm, what I'm seeing also here is just this, this uh, a focus on the company as a as an entire organism that needs to remain healthy and involved because I, I've been on the wrong end. Not, it wasn't even the wrong end. It just, and I would just kind of mentally, I've been in other groups that don't seem to be the focus of what the hot project is this year, this quarter or something like this. And you don't always know what part you play. Um, but it also feels like it, is it, it's not about shiny new objects uh, in terms of, of what you guys are running towards here. And so I feel like that's a great example of the, of the maturity of keeping the organization healthy and how that moves forward. And, and right along with that, I'll go your, your sixth point as we get near the end here is this notion of cost transparency. What are the different ways in which I, I can guess at what that may mean, but I have a feeling it probably, cause you made one of six points. So it probably has multiple uh, angles to it. Um, where does cost transparency fit and how? Yeah, so if you think about um, IT services in general, we got to say yes or no when it came to pre procurement. You know, we were the end all and be all of the IT budget. Whereas that is not the case with cloud. Once you implement a solution, how they burst, how they scale, um, those costs can, those runs are significant and they can happen quickly. So making sure that every team understands their decisions, whether it's when they turn down their POC environment, whether it's, you know, making sure that their applications are scaling and leveraging, you know, all of the servers that are available to them, all of these kind of triggers, those different things, we need to empower the application teams because they're the ones who will make the changes on the app side of the house to really take advantage of cloud. So making those things transparent is key. Um, all the way to um, even now, we're not only looking at cost controls that are reactive, but we're looking proactively where the team knows the cost of their build before they actually hit the button to put it into production, right? So that, that's really where we're looking to change the story so that teams are accountable for their budget rather than IT being accountable for the infrastructure budget. Yeah, that's uh, that's been a long time coming, I think, because also IT is so often historically, you know, been a cost center to be managed 
down, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and kept low. But then as Dave pointed out, everybody is in it, no matter what your business is, there is a, it's a component like financing. It's a component like marketing. Um, uh, and you know, just all the huge components that the business, frankly, you can't take that element out of it. Um, you know, the technology can't be taken out of it and the business would not, it wouldn't be the same and it certainly couldn't compete. Um, so as a, as kind of a final point, I want to make sure we don't miss any, any chance to, to, to uh, extract value out of you, uh, cause I sure appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, but what's next in terms of, um, maybe a little transparency, just speaking about yourself and your career and, and, and what one would be accomplishing. You strike me as a person who probably is much for, you sound much further along than most. And then I bet, but mentally you probably feel like you're constantly behind. I get this feeling you're very competitive probably with yourself and, <laughs> and what you accomplish, but what's the future look like um, for, for where this is going and, and, and what you want to build upon as well as you could see it from this point. Yeah. You know, I am very, very excited about, we've spent a year just trying to get visibility, you know, really getting the right investment to ensure that we could see and try to drive change. This year, we're really focusing on people. We're focusing on upskilling the organization. We're focusing on culture. Um, for me specifically, I feel like there's such a gap in optimize versus accelerate when it comes to cloud. Um, and I'd really like to work with other organizations and tackle that problem. Like, I think we're doing great things at RGA. It's wonderful. I love, uh, I love the momentum. I love the executive support. Um, but I think we could be an example, you know, to other organizations and, and we're really learning. We're learning to accelerate yeah. and, and hopefully, um, as we capture those lessons learned, I would love to see my team, you know, you know, on stage with, you know, whether it's AWS or whatnot, just sharing lessons and, and driving teams to be more productive. Well, you're on our little stage right now, Tech 37, <laughs> um, you know, and, and certainly celebrating as well. Um, that's interesting. So accelerate, you know, kind of you're, you're drawing a contrast there for another conversation perhaps, but making a distinction between acceleration versus optimization. And there's some importance in there, um, it sounds like as well. Thank you so much for taking the time. Dave, I just want to ask you, you were adamant about making sure I did not turn this any kind of a worldwide technology, beat you over the head with a sales hammer type thing. But let's be honest, you guys do provide um, various services. You happen to be in St. Louis area where you've got that incredible advanced technology center, which is a physical wonder to behold. But it's also went online well before the pandemic and people have been accessing services remotely, workshops, briefings. Is there anything um, specific? I'm giving you permission to put on a sales hat for just a moment, pay some bills. Um, anything important to understand about worldwide technologies, capabilities in this area? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, um, you know, I say this to our to our team all the time. We're, we're Switzerland. We, we don't have an agenda for yeah. what a client should be doing. We don't pick the cloud provider or the colo facility unless we're asked to put our two cents in the hat. We're really helped to advise. We're really helped to give lessons learned. We're really here to action those outcomes that you're looking for if you don't have the team yet built to do it. And we can do that across data centers, hybrid, colos, and the public cloud. So when we bring in our networking people, our security people, our app dev people, our data management people, our disaster recovery, we just cover the whole thing really well, which is what really attracted me to to take this role a couple of years ago. It's, it's just a unique offering. Well, it is interesting because I know you guys back up what you say there, because I've also been out to St. Louis and then just virtually with you guys on behalf of other customers. And you guys are amazing about working at different levels of an organization, depending on what the needs are and, and how mm -hmm. invested um, any given company is in terms of the transformation that they're going through um, and kind of positioning resources where they need much more consultative than I would have thought uh, originally. Um, uh, but it's been many years now since we've been working together. But the world keeps changing. And Maria, we need more people like yourself also driving these changes because you're, you're driving a level of education and awareness in something that is also simultaneously changing <laughs> constantly. And so it's not as if that's a body of knowledge that somebody has and you're just trying to get it out of them. You guys, we, you know, we kind of all have to work together to figure it out together uh, as we do it. But those are some great principles. Thank you for taking the time. Dave, thanks for introducing me. 
and uh, and allowing us to do this on Tech 37. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up here. Guys, I do encourage you, WWT.com is where you'll find the platform. It's your virtual ability to access everything St. Louis physically has to offer, but they call it worldwide technology for a reason. Uh, so you can get there from anywhere. They do have uh, just one thing I want to call out this multi-cloud briefing. If that sounds like something that may be of interest to you, it's a nice low impact way to, uh, to get in there, get some questions answered, get exposed to more experts uh, that you tend to meet here on Tech 37. I encourage you to do that as well. But thank you so much for watching the show today. Please continue to join us. And uh, as we continue to come out with more episodes, more smart people. My name is Rob Boyd. You guys have a great one.